Hi, and welcome to our show. Uh, you are watching Making Music. My name's Dan Aroney, and today we have a special guest and musician and collector, Dave Jeffrey. Dave, welcome to our show. It's Dan, good to nice have to see you. you again. Now, you have the distinction of having, or having had, one of the biggest bass collections probably in the United States. And I know just recently you sold a huge part of it uh, to a big collector in Europe. Yeah. and for over half a million dollars. And tell us a little bit about that, that sale and, and well, how most, that came to be. Most of those were uh, like um, a lot of uh, custom color, Fiesta Red, Brigadi Mess, Seafoam Green. And these are fenders, of, of course. All fenders, yeah. all yeah. fender. I was a fanatic with fenders. Growing up all my life with fenders, it was just like, my dad was a fender guy. He said, you're gonna play a P bass. That's what I grew up with. And uh, so through the years on the road, every town we went, I would just, I bought them just because they all felt good, you know yeah. what I mean? Not knowing what, what would turn out, you know, 20, 30 years down the road. How you many know? pieces that did you have at one time? At one time there was about 350, 355, something like that. Which is amazing. That's uh, unbelievable. And this is just being on the road and just picking them up as picking you're going. Picking them up and just, you know. And, and just put, you know, and you totally. storing them away and that's, and bringing them up for a rainy day. Drove my dad nuts, drove yeah. my dad nuts, you know. <laughs> Basement was always full. Yeah. You know? Well, and tell uh, us about the sale some more again. Um, good Did friend of mine from uh, UK. We've been friends for a long time. Um, I hooked him up with a couple 59 Les Pauls and uh, he was fascinated with my collection. He used to say, man, if you ever sell those, please let me know, you know. And I got thinking that, you know, well, it's time to let these go. I've had them for so long. Yeah. Um, I don't play them anymore. I'm a full bred Ernie Ball music man guy now. Yeah, and, we'll talk uh, about that too. Sure, but uh, so um, I said, well, you make me the offer, you know what I mean? And he gave me an incredible offer. So uh, it was a hard decision because I had them for so many years, you yeah. know what I mean? But uh, it uh, went for a little over half a million. And that's and logistically, now we're talking what, about 130 pieces you sold out of your collection. Right. And this is a guy who's coming from Europe, he's packing them up. Now logistically, how do you do something like that? I mean, Well, he said it, he actually was going to come over and help do the, the whole thing. But he has a couple of friends in LA that's like, uh, one's a relative and one's another collector. And uh, they came up with this huge truck. It was like a five, five ton big, box truck you know almost looked like a one of those van line things you right. know and um, we went through the the whole thing pulling one out at a time you know what i mean um, and just serial numbering them and uh, they loaded them up it took about approximately if i can remember it was about nine nine hour day full full on day yeah for that many pieces you know? i would think it was yeah, yeah. Now you also had now and and i mean that that's an amazing you do not hear sales like that very often and again What's amazing about you is that most of the players that I deal with that collect are guitar players. It is right. so rare to see a bass player actually collect the pieces and, and for so long as you have. I mean, yeah. you, are, you absolutely are a rarity in the field because it just, I come across so few, bass, most bass players have two, three, four basses, that's yeah. it. Well, you know, there's Norman's Rare Guitars. Norman, he has his own private collection. Yeah. And Albert uh, Molinato, I think, from uh, used to have uh, Guitars R Us in L.A. Mm -hmm. He probably has two or three hundred left. Yeah, you know what I mean. But there's yeah, yeah but there's these really are stores. This is a this is a whole different thing. You're yeah. an individual who's who's collecting. Where these yeah. are yeah, these are stores. It's like you know, it's like Gary's collection at Guitar Showcase, where he has over six hundred pieces. But he's a, he's a music store owner, right, so it's right. easier to do it with. I that, remember so. talking with John Whistle one time at uh, at uh, the Nam Show. And he was saying, he says, yeah, you know, he says, we are a rare breed, but it's a beautiful thing, isn't it? <laughs> and he, he says, I walk in my room and I smell the oma of an old case. Yeah. You know, it has so, that busty smell. To yeah. It. Well, yeah. now let's say, uh, now you're on to Music Man. Yes. Now you've been doing that for quite some time and you again are in still possession of probably one of the most amazing Music Man yeah. collections, probably in all of California, if not the United States. Right. I have 130 Ernie Ball Music Man bases. <laughs> I think they are by far the best uh, bass on the market. That's my own And I agree feeling. with you. I've, I've been an they, absolute yes. Music Man fan ever since I saw Lewis Johnson playing one um, exactly. years ago. And he has these big old hands and he's just flying right? on this yeah. thing. And with the, the three band parametric EQ they have on those, it's just yeah, an they, amazing up high, low, everything. In totally, between. totally. Yeah. And they've done such a great job. Uh, 
Uh, Sterling Ball is a genius. He is uh, so picky about the quality control. He doesn't let anything go out with, a, I mean, like I was at the, uh, going through open house, they had a, a beautiful neck that they would cut the headstock off because it had a little tiny knot in it. Sterling yeah. says, no, we don't let that stuff out, yeah. you know? Now this company, for those who don't know, uh, he, they're in San Luis Obispo. Correct. So this is a U.S. made, yes. California made base. Yes, just, uh, uh, just incredible. So they tell just, us a little uh, bit about the, about the Sterling Ball story there. Well, and, and, and um, Sterling, uh, you know, Sterling designed the Sterling Ball base uh, for him. Um, Ernie Ball, they bought the company in uh, 84. Because Leo Fender had a part um, of this for a Leo while. Leo Fender started it off uh, back in like the 70s. And I had a few of those in the 70s, probably about 25 of them. Mm -hmm. And they were just... Uh, As I remember, they were very weedy. It's very like a lot weighty. of the stuff that I remember seeing that comes out of the 70s that just... Just, just logs. Right. Absolutely. They were just so heavy. They were like, I had some that were like 13 pounds. Yeah, which you know is unheard I mean? of. I mean, even a Les Paul, for those of you who have played Les Pauls, I mean, a, Les Pauls are eight to nine pounds, and guys, you know, wear out their right. backs with a nine totally. pound guitar. 13 pounds is 13. absolutely unheard of. Yeah, and they were a lot, you know, and they really had not very stable necks. In fact, I remember talking to Leo Fender at the NAMM show in 1978. And asked him, you know, like, you know, these necks are just, you know, they feel great, but, you know, I, a lot that I had, I had problems with them, mm -hmm. you know. And um, so basically what happened after Leo got out of it, I think Charvel Jackson, uh, they made them for like, I think like four, four years, I think, mm -hmm. from 80 to 84. Then Ernie Ball bought the company. And then... Uh, I was on tour through here in California. I was living in Nashville at the time. And I came through and uh, we went to a guitar center and I seen this white music man bass that looked brand new. And I go, that's weird. And here it was an Ernie Ball. Yeah. And I go, is Ernie Ball making music Big man? Band, yeah. You know, so I bought that one and that was the beginning of uh, like just amazing stuff. Well, we got a couple of pieces that you brought along. And uh, let's let's uh, hold these up. Let's if we can uh, well, pull these up and, and show them. This here. This is an amazing piece, just because it's such a gorgeous piece of quilted maple. Let's yes. Tell us a little bit about um, this one. This one here was actually made for a uh, very good bass player out of Nashville, Dave Fowler. Mm -hmm. They custom made these for Dave, and uh, they what did. What year was this? Now, this what? was '92. Okay. This was. Uh, so this is already 16 years old. Now. Right. Yeah. Right. And I hope uh, that's 14 years old. 14, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, close. Yeah, yeah, right. But what the deal was on this was uh, Dave was a big fan of Eddie Van Halen, and Eddie was with Music Man then. Right. So he wanted kind of a takeoff of Eddie's guitar. With the binding, right. With the binding. Yeah, exactly. And they did the binding, um, as you can see. Um, very highly figured neck. And um, Dudley Gimbel, who is another genius at, at Ernie Ball, He's the guy that did the binding on these, and uh, and just amazing. Just like the quality control on these things are just, you know, and I probably that. buy four or five a month. Now I notice this one only has the two, the three knobs. I know the volume, and it's a right. two-band parametric instead of a three-band. Dave Fowler was so. real, like his whole sound was that two-band preamp. Mm -hmm. You know, I like so the what two bands. So what you just got high and low and no mids on this? Is Correct. That what it is? Okay. Correct. I like the two bands, and I was a two band guy forever. And then they come out with the three band, and now it's this, the cool thing with the three band is, I go out on the road now. I fly out to Nashville. I don't care what the amp is because it don't really matter. Mm -hmm. It can be a crappy amp, and you plug the bass in, and you know, and it's amazing. It doesn't you know? matter. Doesn't matter. Yeah. You now know? here's another one we have. Tell us about this one. This one here is a. Uh, also, a uh, great color. Great if color. You, if you can see that on the screen, it's it's a red sparkle. And uh, very nice base, uh, matching headstock. With a matching headstock. Um, now, what do they call this nut now? I see this. If you can get a picture of that. It's a new compensated nut. Okay. And that, that's uh, a Dudley Gimbal, Ernie Ball thing. They, uh, they patent that together, I believe. And the cool thing with that is... At first, being a hardcore guy, I like the smaller nuts like this, mm -hmm. but uh, when it first came out, I was going, ah, big old chunky nut. But you know, I was in the studio about three weeks ago doing a demo for a friend, and I could not believe how, how much better it keeps your guitar in tune down here, mm -hmm. which, which was, I was like, wow. 
So now I'm a big fan of those nuts. Yeah, yeah. they definitely work. So it's you know also I mean? a tuning. It's a, it's a tuning. Yeah, advantage they to did that a well. they did a great. Uh, yeah, and here's tell us a little bit about this one. Uh, now. This is the 30th anniversary Stingray. Okay, That's, so this is the latest edition that they've right. just come out with recently. 2006. And I thought they were doing the 30th in gold hardware. No, that's limited edition. Okay, that's a different. That's a different. That's run. correct. Okay. This one here has a mahogany body, and uh, sounds really, really punchy. You know, I was just like, uh, I think I end up buying like four or five of those now. Mm -hmm. They're just like incredible. Yeah, gorgeous, gorgeous piece of they wood. They just too. sound so good. Yeah. That mahogany sounds so and good. And here's another one. This is a little wild now. Again, this a champagne, is, like a champagne sparkle. Yes, this is the. Uh, God bless her. This is, this is your glam this is, rock guitar. This is my favorite guitar. <laughs> really? It's uh, uh, next to the Red Sparkle. This one's probably my most favorite, but yeah. this is next in line. I just, uh, that's, that's my ski boat, and I just love it. It's just. Uh, it's a great weight. It's very light. Yeah, it's too. very light. Yeah. I, most the, out of the 130 music men's that I have, most of them don't weigh over nine pounds. Yeah. This is amazing you weight. Know. For those who know basses, this thing has to be about seven to eight pounds. Yeah, which it's is just a great right weight around for, yeah. eight. Yeah. yeah. It's, yeah. Uh, now we have a couple fenders in the back that are just juicy here. I got, I got to get this one. And this is. That's a 1962. This, this is a 1962 Fiesta, Fiesta, Red, Fiesta Red P bass. With a Brazilian neck, with a Brazilian fingerboard. Yeah. And tell us a little bit about this guy. It's. Um, when I sold the stuff off, I said, you know, I definitely have to keep some pieces. So I kept about 10 old Fenders, a couple of blondes, and I kept one Fiesta Red just because the color was, yeah. you know. Now, this has an estimated market value now of what you think? Between fifteen and $20,000. Yeah. Right. And it's just so rare. This is one of the, what they call the custom color, of course. Right. The, and, and rare so, for that year, too, because yeah. not a lot of custom colors were coming out of Fender back in... Uh, and uh, 62. Yeah, amazing, amazing. And it's a curve Beautiful board, piece. it's not a slab board, yeah. so it's right around September 62. Yeah, and here we got another one. Let me grab this back here. Another fender. It's another really light one. Awesome. And this is in beautiful condition. Very little yeah. wear on this. 1966. Now this is extremely rare because of? A maple cap yeah. fretboard. Which you didn't see in 1966. Very, not on basses. Right. You see them on guitars, right. but very rarely on basses. Yeah. And um, there's no stripe down the back, mm -hmm. you know what I mean, on the back. So um, it's just yeah. your maple cap. And now what's the estimated value of this piece? On that one is really tough. There was one on some website in New York that sold for fourteen thousand, but you know. So this is still in the ten to twenty thousand yeah, dollar range, you know, yeah, and extremely rare. I, in all the years I've been collecting for the store, I have never come across anything like this. I, I mean, even remotely with a with a maple top. So yeah, they just uh, you know, like yeah. some of the ones I sold in my collection were actually. Uh, where like I sold a sixty-two and a sixty-three that actually had maple necks. Mm -hmm with the stripe down yeah. but not maple caps yeah. you know which was also rare because they were pretty much rosewood boards back then yeah well i think what we're going to do now is we're going to bring tim breen on and uh you're going to play a little bit for us oh cool is that okay yes you mind and then when we get back we'll talk a little bit about your turbo tube sure but i'd like to bring in uh, tim breen right now uh he's one of our master guitar players at guitar showcase excuse me here. Uh, welcome tim and you guys are going to do a little tune for us sure how you doing, Tim? Good to see you again. All righty. This is a, an old blues song that uh, when I worked with Johnny Paycheck, uh, when he would come out and use the band and stuff, we always used to do this, and it's a great old blues shuffle. Key A minor. A one, two, three, four. I was busted in Austin, walking around in the days. Yeah, I was sitting in that slammer, looking at these bars in the haze. Well, it'll all clear up now, 11 months and 29 days. 
Keep the Lone Star cold, keep the dance floor hot when I'm gone. Keep the Lone Star cold, keep the dance floor hot when I'm gone. Stay away from my woman, boys, cause I ain't gonna be gone too long. All right, Tim. Little judge put a sledgehammer in my hand when he said, I'm gonna send you down to Huntsville, boy. We're gonna shave your face and your head. Y'all be delivering 29 with a cement flow for your bed. Ah, oh, let's hear it again. Walking around in a days. Well, I was looking at, looking at, looking at, looking at, looking at, looking at these bars in a haze. Well, it'll all clear up now. Eleven months and twenty-nine days. Oh, you know it. Well, it'll all clear up now. Eleven months and twenty-nine days. Good plan. <laughs> awesome. Cool. Absolutely right. awesome. Thank you. Here, I'll help you go. Sure. Well, we're gonna bring some. We're gonna bring some pictures up now. Some, oh, cool. Uh, pictures uh, and uh, and let's see if we can get uh, some of these pictures brought up and tell us a little bit about these, if you would. Well, that was a picture that was taken by Paul Haggart from the Bass Player Magazine, and they were going to do a. Uh, uh, they had a vintage magazine at the time, and they were going to uh, go ahead and uh, take some pictures for the vintage magazine. So that photo was taken by him. Great shot. And, uh, now talk yeah. about absolutely, you know, holy grail bases, right? Yeah, there. there's some, the uh, yeah, there were some yeah. good shots that's, in there. That's for, great. Now tell us a little bit about this. This was last week up in uh, Chico, California. Oh, wow. So this is very recent. Yes, yeah, so yeah. I was working with uh, John Cody Carter and... Uh, the whole band was Merle Haggard's band, mm -hmm. pretty much. John had a couple of guys playing in the band. And uh, they do this every year, a benefit concert. Mm -hmm. So I used to tour with John, and I still go out on some dates, but not so much anymore because he likes to pound the road. And, yeah. And I don't, you know. And you're more of a homebody. I'm more now. of a home guy <laughs> now, you know. Understood. Uh, what's this? Tell us about this. This is uh, Johnny Paycheck. He used to come out to California when he'd do like two or three dates, you know, and uh, he'd hire the band that I had at the time. It was working the West 40 Club. Yeah. So that's easy for him. You can come out and then have the local band. Right, because we'd do all his all his tunes yeah. in the same keys and yeah. everything. So yeah. he would hire us. Oh, and, that's great for him. And John and I have been friends since probably nineteen. Now he had, of course, his famous song was "Take uh, This Job and Shove It." Take your job and shove it. Take this job and shove it. <laughs> now tell us a little bit about this one. This is Mr. Leland Sklar, who I've idolized and I've heard about since I was probably knee high. My dad was a big uh, fan of his, and uh, okay. I've always uh, idolized the guy. And uh, now, what's he? Uh, tell us a little bit well, about. Well, he's on every uh, guys on every session that you can think of these days. He did the, the latest Merle Haggard record. Mm -hmm. Does he, he play uh, bass as well? Yep, he's bass a bass player. player. Yep. Okay. He's done yeah. um, um, James Taylor for years. Um, he worked uh, uh, George Strait, a lot of George Strait records, yeah. you know what I mean? He looks like if he put the beanie on it, took the glass, it looked like ZZ Top. Yes. So. 
Now, how about this shot? This is a good. This is this looks. This like is a going back. Go. This is back. Now I can tell it's you because it has your belt buckle says DJ on it. And so. I'm a little uh, thinner. Yeah, right. <laughs> before Carl's Jr. <laughs> then before Carl's Jr. You got it. Uh, this was the Marble Heart Station Band out of London, Ontario, Canada, that I worked with just for a little bit. Uh -huh. We were on the road for a while, and uh, it was kind of like a country bluesy kind of kind of thing. More country bluesy. Yeah. Kind of you know. And uh, that's, I don't even know what year that was. Oh no, my this God. is the best yeah, of all. Is, <laughs> that was probably 1971 or two. I think I was like 13 or 14. Oh, this is 13 years old. So this must have been when you, just about when you started playing? Well, no, I started playing when I was around nine or 10. Yeah. And when I was about 11 or 12, my dad, we had a band, this band, mm -hmm. that my dad would book. Yeah for us you know we now was this these. in this area this was in the san jose area no this or was where, where in was this? Uh, this in canada okay canada that's right because i was yeah. born and raised in canada yeah. so, so this is still canada now yeah and i'm holding a 68 jazz bass with a blown l-tech speaker yeah. there. now we know who that is mr willie nelson yeah we did a john and i we did a, an album up at willie studio in spicewood texas mm -hmm. and uh we were doing our record at the same time merle and willie were doing an album called sea Swords of old mexico so on our swing album, we did a duet, Willie sang and did a duet with yeah. us and stuff. That oh. was with John Cody Carter, actually. Oh, that is great. Great shot. Yeah, yeah. he uh, fell off his bike and broke his Is thumb. that right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he looks like he's going to be out of commission for a few weeks. Yeah. And this was uh, at Silverthorne, Merle Haggart. That's Merle Haggart. Mm -hmm. And he had a resort up there. And we used to uh, live on the houseboat and play the club and, and hang out and jam with Merle and listen to all his great stories of. Uh, so you've been rubbing shoulders with quite a few, quite a few people. Yeah, over, over the, the years. years. Yeah, yeah. Just, those are some great shots. Yeah, it was it was, it was a lot of fun. Now, of I, I, now let's talk before because we're running out of time right now. But let's talk. You have a couple inventions that I want to I want you to tell us about. <clears throat> yeah, now, this has been around for a while too. Yeah, I started doing. What happened was, is, you know, having all these bases. Yeah. I just got tired of doing the strings myself. Mm -hmm. So um, I come up, designed a product that would work on my bases, and I wanted something that would fit on a drill. You know what I mean? So you get this uh, yeah, let's get right here. Right. Here it is here. So basically, and um, so uh, I got together. I had the, the whole, all the ideas and everything together. I got a hold of a company in Pleasanton called Pear Designs, mm -hmm. and uh, he... Uh, came in partners with me he's a design guy and I showed him what I what I had and uh, we come up with this and it's turned out pretty successful for us we do all the our own manufacturing we sell to Dunlop so it's, is this see. distributed through Jim Dunlop Enterprises yes you can, like, it seems to me I remember this being at Dean Markley yeah we leased it to Dean Markley for five years okay and then we took it back and we did uh, we redesigned it mm -hmm. and uh, we went ahead and uh, uh, do all we own our all our own machines and everything and uh, we do all the the, the bubble r stuff and right you know what i mean and it's been very successful for us it's been great because a lot of steel players like it and yeah it's a winder that fits every guitar and every bass and every bass yeah that yeah. is absolutely superb and it's you know I, i've seen i mean they're in our store as well yeah so you guys this do is stuff thank that you for we, that yeah too, oh yeah. you're welcome yeah, yeah it's, it's very very yeah so okay. and I think I don't know if we have the picture still that we can bring up of your one of the albums that you've on, been the, one of the CDs yeah. or, or John that Cody. You're on. Yeah. I don't know if we can if uh, we can pull that. Uh, here we go. Tell us a little bit about that. John Cody is probably one of the most amazing singers that I've known for years. One of the guys that I I met kind of when I was out here on on, on a tour, and uh, he's moved back to Nashville and he's been in Nashville for years, but. Um, the cool thing with John is that a lot of big stars they don't very they don't pay all that well. Mm -hmm. John paid really really like he would pay like five hundred dollars a show and yeah. stuff like that. Yeah, pay more than everybody else. Yeah, and he great songwriter, and he's one of the few guys that let the the band play the way you want to play. You know, Nashville is so curved now that you get the record and you learn everything on the record and that's how they want it. Right. Exactly. John was one of those guys that let you play the way you wanted to play. So I've spent many years with him. It was it was great. Yeah. yeah. Well, I know we're starting to wind down uh, right now, and I want to thank you for coming on. This oh, has been this absolutely was, a, a treasure. This to, was a to, pleasure. You know, to talk about the vintage guitars, and I think we're going to end with you playing with uh, the band. Oh yeah, with the uh, Hag band. Up yep, in, up this in, is the uh, Chico. Up in Chico uh, with John's band. Did, so yeah. thank you, Dave. Thank it's you really again. Thanks. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Here's a song called. Empty your arms to work. <laughs>
It's like prison walls. 